it comes from Murph Gribble, uh, John Lusk, and Albert York, who were a black string band trio from Campaign, Tennessee, recorded in 1946. I have been playing this tune for, like, what, six years now? Um, very long time for me. Um, and have not taught it before, I don't think, so it'll be follow us. Um, but it's a fun tune. There's not too much that's odd about it. The B part has a funky structure, but actually broken down, it makes a lot more sense than if you are just listening to a, you know, 60 year old recording and trying to figure out what is being done. Um, really almost 80 year old uh, by the time I got around to it. So we'll get to do a little bit of up the neck adventuring, um, get to make a few different textures with the banjo. Um, it's a good versatile tune, or requires you to be versatile anyway. We're doing standard G tuning. Okay, Also note, Murph Gribble, the banjo player on this recording, was a three-finger banjo player. He did not play it like this. This is me learning the tune. Um, I have since had to learn like three different ways because I learned it on fiddle and then moved my fiddle version to banjo, and then my bandmate Tatiana learned it on fiddle, and I changed my banjo part to suit her fiddle version, and then my bandmate George learned it on fiddle, and I changed my banjo part again to accommodate that. It's a weird recording. There's some gray area there. Um, one of the more important gray areas is that there's no consistent tune structure. They pretty much just play the B part for as long as they want to. And then at some point, they just pop back into the A part and start over. Um, they did that with most of their tunes. There's a lot of stuff where you can hear he'll just do some specific variation of the fiddle part that signals it is time to go back to the A part, and that is how the band knows to turn it around again. Uh, this tune doesn't even seem to have that going for it. Uh, I don't really know how they coordinated. Maybe there was a visual sig signal that we have lost. 
Um, I'm gonna try and just do the B part two times because that seems like it'll be what's easiest to uh, fit in our brains. I feel like it's the morning, even though it's like barely the morning. I woke up very early for me today um, to drive here for a long time. So uh, if I say something that doesn't make sense, just tell me and I will try to go back over it again. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I just don't like the morning. Wow. Um, um, Alright, so... the way I usually play that A part phrase, so... <coughs> so, we start out with just this... That's a really odd phrase, but let's try to keep it all together. So, one, two... in the middle of it. So try that.
time for questions. <laughs> it, the goal is for everybody to learn. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I just, um, this is my first time actually like, playing with other banjo players. Oh, so welcome. To learn by watching rather than like through taps, which has been my only exposure, is just like tricky to Yeah, it's a, it's a tough brain thing. Yeah. I had to do the opposite thing last week. I was, uh, and this in this thing up in the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, and I had to like sight read tablature mm. for like a through composed semi classical thing. Yeah. Very hard. Yeah. So uh, there's no easy way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess the thing here, there's a drop thumb on the top two strings. <laughs> Just try that much. Yeah. <coughs> And then a pull off from the second fret on the third string to the open third string. Yeah. So. And then just the second fret on the fourth string. It's helpful to know that, especially once you start going up the neck, at least on the first string, because sometimes you're just going to have to go up here to get the melody, you know that like 5, 7, 9, like those are all in the key. So those are probably the ones you're going to use, and then you don't have to worry as much about like, is that a 6? Is that a 7? Because those just like, or 6 or 8 or whatever, because um, those don't appear that much. Um, one other thing to note is that obviously we have just ended this on a E minor situation. So from here on out, we're pretty much going to hold down the E minor shape when we're playing. So the B part is. The interesting thing about this tune is that on the recording, um, 
the guitar player just stays on a G chord the entire time. The banjo player stays on an E minor the whole time, and the fiddle player goes back and forth between a G and E minor depending on which repetition of the tune it is. It's like a variation for him. So there's this very cool thing that happens on the recording where they're all sort of disagreeing about what key the song is in, um, and it creates a really cool sound. So this is one, if you're playing it in a jam or whatever, you would play an E minor, it would sound like way too much if the guitar player was to also play an E minor, in my opinion. But um, it's just a good thing to be aware of. Sometimes the chords we play don't match the chords of the overall tune. With that, we can go into the B part. This bears some explaining before we start playing it. Um, basically, the B part is three phrases. this in terms of those pieces than to try to just go through accounting measures because they don't line up in a super obvious way. Um, so we'll start with just the first one, I guess. and then just moving the middle finger around to get those other notes. Okay. So our next little phrase, we've done. Though it implies a change to the five chord, even though 
know, as I said, we don't follow through on any chord changes in the entirety of this tune. So... <laughs> second time on, join when you're ready.
Yeah. Yeah, I think, um... Yeah. I was trying to think about that. Is that why? feel crooked anymore because I played it for too long, but it is, you're right. Um, cool. We learned the tune. We have plenty of time left. Um, so we can either try to like rush through a second tune or uh, actually okay. that would be a stretch, but we can try. Um, other option would be Jay, to... would you would you could you just Show us how you make special use of the extra string on your banjo. Uh, yeah, this is not the best tune to show that because I just hit it. Yeah, I don't do. I don't. I don't ever play melody on it, really. Really? Okay. No, it's just like a low drum thing. Um, so there's like one tune I play. Um, actually. John Lusk and Albert York.
Um, but it could be two or four. Yeah. You're doing that at the end, at the transition between the first and the second, but the A part, you're doing a kind of a nice slide down. I'm not mm -hmm. sure it was in the, in the show or school. I couldn't make it happen slow. I tried to do it and it just didn't work at not full cool. speed. Um, so yeah, that is in there. Uh, the down slide is there. I tried to do it there and it just kind of turned into like and I was like, that's not that's not a compelling sound. So decided to you going fast, that sounds fun. Yeah, it sounds yeah, everything sounds great when it's too fast for you to know how it sounds, you know? Um Jake, did you make a choice to drop the thumb down to the first string instead of using fifth string there? Um, yeah. It's a different sound. Mm -hmm. Even the notes are the same, but there's it's a so different thing though. happening. It's so far away from yeah. the thumb. It's it like, is far. Yeah. But I also think I do that sometimes. So I drop them to the second string instead of the first sometimes. But also, I think there's just a... Versus... There's like a ring thing yeah. that is different. Um, and that's like getting like too detailed for like 90% of the time you're playing. If you're in a jam or a band, no one's gonna notice that but you. But even like, I learned to play this tune as the thing that I'm doing with a fiddle player. But like, honestly, even the A part, if I was doing it by myself, I might. Or something like that. This string is not in tune in both places right now, but. So you can get a little bit more ring happening at a time. That tends to suit my taste for solo banjo a little bit better than single string maneuvering. Um, but for the most part, um, it is as I taught it to you. Can you tell us something about the original performers? Yeah. And the original recording? Yeah, um, so as I said, the original recording was from Campaign, Tennessee in 1946. I don't remember who the folklorist was who made it. Um, was it Work? No, Work did um, Fraser and Patterson. Okay. These were different folks. So this is, these, are, these recordings are on a compilation CD that you can buy or stream. Uh, it's called Altamont, Black String Band Music from the Library of Congress. There's more Gribblesque and York recordings than are on that compilation that you have to go to the Library of Congress to find or ask me because I bootlegged them and I can send you the Google Drive link. Um, and um, yeah, it's a, it's a very cool compilation disc. Those performers were from close, and relatively close to each other and from the same time period. So I want to say the Fraser and Patterson recordings are from 42 um, and the Gribble Lesk and York recordings are 46. One of the key differences, they're two very different sounding ensembles. Fraser and Patterson were like a radio spectacle band uh, in Nashville. They had from, to my understanding, uh, a radio guy was basically like, you two both play string band music. You should be a duo on my radio show. And that that's how they became a band. So they were always in show business. Um, and my sense is that Nathan Frazier was kind of like a trick banjo player. Like he was really flashy and had a lot of gimmick. Um, he was also very modern um, and does a lot of things in his playing like those syncopated drop thumbs that I use a lot in this, uh, like that opening rhythm we did, da, 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 where I learned how to do that from listening to those recordings and just like cross-referencing with other lessons I've had with living players, just, you know, how you learn tunes at the beginning. And um, then I realized that he was doing a lot of the same licks that like John Herman and Richie Stearns reintroduced, you know, 30 to 40 years down the line, um, which is pretty cool. By the same token, I would argue that Gribblesque and York are actually an early bluegrass band and don't get called that 
because they're black and because they were playing like that before Bill Monroe was. <laughs> um, but you know, it's three finger banjo, it's flashy, they pass the melody back and forth. Um, I do think there's a noteworthy difference in that we know black string bands of that era had two separate repertoires that they would play for black versus white audiences. And the folklorist who recorded Fraser and Patterson was John Wesley Work III, who was a black folklorist. A very rare thing now, rarer still at the time when he was around, and he was affiliated, I think he did his undergrad at Fisk University, did his master's degree at Columbia, and then went back to Fisk to teach and collect. And Fraser and Patterson wound up performing at like the centennial celebration of Fisk um, for like, W.E.B. Du Bois and like all like the, the black luminaries of the time, which is pretty cool. Um, Fraser and Patterson were recorded by white folks. Famously a very odd recording session because the white guys who set it up decided we're going to do it in like the local general store, not thinking through the fact that the general store was segregated <laughs> and black people weren't supposed to be in there. <laughs> so the store made an exception good on them um but you have to think that would have been an extremely uncomfortable yeah. situation for the band um and the you know they were already playing their like sanitized white people friendly repertoire which was different from some of the other stuff they had and there are recordings of some of the other things that they did that you can there's a website that's just like gribbleluskinyork.com um and it has more stuff on there. But the recordings that are out there are recordings they made for a white audience in an establishment where they were not legally supposed to be at the time. Um, one of those ways in which, you know, when you go back and study those old field recordings, I think there's a tendency in old time music to treat those as like the gospel truth of what the music was, when like really that's just how it was played that one time on that one day in sometimes a very odd set of circumstances. Like a lot of those recordings come out of players being completely out of their element. And you know, in some academic setting or in like a commercial or radio setting that they weren't used to, or you know, they hadn't been playing for the past 40 years. And then some folklore shows up and it's like, your neighbor told me you played fiddle when you were 20. Here's an instrument, play me tunes. And they're like, I don't remember any, what's going on? You know, there's a lot of those out there also. Um, was that some of the early recordings of Dink Roberts when he was uh, refound? I don't, he so, been so Dink had at least been playing slide guitar. Um, and Dink Roberts was a black banjo player from Paw River, North Carolina who had a super weird banjo style. Um, I have made some study of it, um, only have one tune that I teach and I've taught it enough times that I didn't want to overlap today. Um, and he was a very good slide guitar player. He played guitar blues, and my understanding is that the folklorists who went to record Dink were only interested in finding black banjo players and therefore just did not record most of the music that he could play. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Are there any recordings of him playing guitar? I've not that I know of. Um, and I, I checked, I was talking to Justin Robinson about this, <laughs> just in July, who's one of the original members of the Carolina Chocolate Drops and an extremely deep scholar of black string band traditions, especially in North Carolina. He's really done a lot of focused study on the area that he is from and where he now lives. Um, and he's done a lot of looking into Dink. Um, feels strongly that there's also a really significant indigenous influence in the way that he plays, because Dink was also native. Um, and yeah, he had his own weird thing going on. But again, another situation of the folklorist capturing this tiny fragment of the thing that he did, and like not the main fragment either. <laughs> um, but I think Joe and Odell Thompson, who were the ones who taught the Carolina, well, Joe Thompson was the one who taught the Carolina Chocolate Drops, who then taught me. So I don't know, my fiddle granddad. Um, he stopped playing for, I think, like 40 years. Like when he went off to the war, World War II, I'm pretty sure he stopped playing during or just before the war and then didn't pick it back up again until folklorists rediscovered him in like the 80s or whatever. So there was a lot of 
picking things up and putting them down as urbanization and modernization drove the music in new directions. Um, and that's also always you have recorded Rolling Burning. Have I have recorded Rolling Burning. Yeah. Yes. So uh, which of your CDs? Reparations. My very first little EP, yeah. which is out of print. I don't have it with me, but it is on all the streaming things. So if you want to hear that in practice, uh, you can hear the me of six years ago play it. it. It's not what it sounds like now, but it is. It hasn't changed that much. Um, any other questions about banjo things? I yeah. have a question. Uh -huh. Oh, so you've heard you heard that song and it got in your brain. Like, where do you go from there? Like, how do you start working up a song like that? What's your creative process? And then when do you feel good about it? Like, yeah, that could never end. Well, yeah, that's definitely, I mean, that song is a moving target. Is that the original recording of Rolling River is like my favorite old time recording at all. Mm -hmm. Like, it's so good. Um, and it's because of the weird chord tension thing and everything else. There's like a specific mix of things there that I've never been able to replicate. And I've done this in a bunch of different formats where like, you know, I first heard this, heard the tune. I was like, I need to learn this tune. And then I couldn't really figure out the structure because the B part is super weird. Um, and then Tatiana and I sort of figured it out together with me playing banjo and it was really fun to play. It sounded nice to me, but, um, didn't have the same thing that the original recording had. There's just like this this hum that happens the whole time. It's just like such a clean ride of a tune, the way that they play it. And I was like, maybe it needs the guitar. So I added the guitar and it didn't sound the same way. And then I was like, maybe it needs the three finger banjo instead of my claw hammer adaptation. So I started playing it on fiddle and my bandmate George Jackson was playing it on three finger banjo. And it's closer, but it still doesn't sound like that. And at, a, at the end of the day, it had, comes down to like the miking and the recording quality, I think. Like there's a thing the tape is doing on that recording that I can't do live or with, uh, with modern recording technology. So maybe I just need to record the next album on tape that I could do that. Um, but yeah, it's a, always a moving target. My general process for learning tunes because this is one I have spent like more detail time on than I do most of them. Um, be ready to slow things down. Uh, there's a program called the Amazing Slowdowner that a lot of people have. I have used it quite extensively since it's familiar to some of you. Um, is this like an app or something? What is it? It is an app, but it's also a computer program. You can get it on your computer and you can get it on your phone. Um, I mostly use it on the computer because phones don't like you to actually have files anymore. Um, but it basically lets you plug something in, shift the pitch however much you need, because oftentimes on those old recordings, either the people weren't in tune or like the record or cylinder got like copied to tape at a weird speed or an inconsistent speed or the recording was at an inconsistent. There's a lot of things that can go wrong pitch wise. Yeah. So you can fix that. You can loop certain sections of the tune over and over and over again. Um, like sound you can set a sound sound thing or a, a time loop uh, on the recording and you can choose how fast it goes. So you can slow it way, way down. You can slow it down too much and it gets harder rather than easier. That's <laughs> possible to do. Um, but if you don't feel like spending the 40 bucks on Amazing Slow Downer, which it is a worthwhile 40 bucks, if you look up recordings that are on YouTube, you can now slow YouTube videos down. Um, it has less fine control than the Amazing Slow Downer was. Like you can go to like 0.75 times or like 0.5 or 0.25. Uh, 0.75 is for me like the bottom limit of how slow something can be and still be useful for learning purposes. Beyond that, I'm just like, wow, sign tones. <laughs> this is not a song anymore. <laughs> so I have found that one is like good for extremely slow, I don't know what's going on, and then full speed, uh, whereas Amazing Slow Downer lets you adjust to wherever you need to be. Yeah, I always do that. Um, I usually try to spend a little bit of time with just like whatever okay. surrounding context and tradition there is. Um, 
Okay. And that can be different depending on the region and the person that I'm studying because sometimes I just don't know enough about what was happening around them. But like when I was learning tunes from like Theodore Jackson, who's a black fiddle player, was a black fiddle player from outside of Austin, he plays in the style that's like between old time fiddle and blues fiddle and Cajun fiddle, which is very cool, but I only play one of those three things. So in order to like actually get the tune down, I had to do a little bit of study on the other two styles, or even if it's just listening focused in a focused way, um, in order to really understand what he was doing. And I still think I need to like, you know, when I play his tunes, I'm like, I need to spend more time learning blues fiddle because I'm not like getting the tone that he's getting because I don't use the bow that way and I need to learn how. So they all develop over time, but I think it's just about um, zooming into the details on the tune itself and speeding it up to playing speed very slowly um, and then also keeping the big picture in mind. So what inspired you to add a, a deep, a bass drone string to the um, Partially the fact that I was playing in duos constantly at the time when I commissioned this. Um, so it was kind of a practical, like, there's never any low end in the band, and I'm tired of that situation. Um, which, it does do a lot to remedy. This banjo is great in a duo situation. It's also great solo for that reason. Um, it doesn't always cut the way I would want in a band, because it overlaps a lot with the guitar, mm -hmm. uh, tonally and pitch-wise. But um, I got the idea from, there's a, a black string bands called the Snowden Family Band, mm -hmm. who were from Ohio, um, pre-Civil War. Like, they, they moved up there as freedmen before emancipation happened. Um, purportedly, may, may be the original source of the song Dixie, that apparently they might have written this as, like, a satire of, like, can you imagine missing the South? What an awful place. And then it, like, went completely over the heads of their white audience, and then it turned into the anthem of the Confederacy. Um, fascinating they, they, tale they were, there. They were neighbors of Emmett, weren't they? Exactly. Yeah, Daniel Decatur Emmett, the Black Basements, really popularized that tune, lived down the street from them. So the, the assumption is that he learned it from them, did not understand that it was a joke, and then went down South with it, and they also didn't get the joke um and so on and so forth but there's a photo that exists of ben and lou snowden who were the two brothers who were sort of the centerpiece of the band um sitting in the open gable in their house which is where they played their dances out of the family would be up in this open gable and people would like dance and party out on their lawn um and Lou Snowden, the banjo player, had uh, an extra peg in the middle of his headstock. And I was like, I wonder what that's about. That seems like too much. And then three years went by and I was like, it's because he's playing in a duo with a fiddle player and he wanted some low end. And I want that. So um, when I asked, this is a Cedars Instruments banjo from my friend Will down in Dorset. And um, when I asked him to make it, I was just like, would you put on an extra string for me? And he was like, I've always wanted to see what would happen. And, you know, I'm never going to use another banjo. I say until I buy my next banjo, but, um, you know, it's, it's not in the, in the sights at this point. Um, and what is it tuned to? The low string I keep as an octave of the third string, so they're both G's right now, um, or usually they're G's or A's. Yeah. One other interesting thing about the Snowden family band is we have a, a very small amount of documentation of women playing old time music as well as black people, um, partially due to bias on the part of the folklorists, I'm sure, partially because the women probably wouldn't have been out like playing dances and stuff because they were expected to do stuff around the home. So they were responsible for a lot of the teaching and transmission of this music but would not have been as free to go out and perform it. Um, and partially because these instruments had like unsavory connotations back in the day. Like these were drinking, carousing, partying instruments and affiliated with the devil. And like no good Christian girl was supposed to be playing these. The Snowden family band on its marketing materials prominently bragged about the fact that their fiddlers were women, that two of Ben and Lou's sisters 
whose names I don't remember because they never got recorded or photographed, to my knowledge. Um, I think one of them was Rose. They played the fiddle in the band, and that was like remarkable to people at the time that these two women were doing it. it of course, it's like couched in a very patronizing language in the advertisement. It's like featuring two women who have mastered the violin and like despite the frailty of their sex. Um, just like, it's, it's unfortunate, but also cool because there isn't that much about that from that time period. Much As far as I know, they're the only two black women who played fiddle that we have any information about at all. Um, there are some black women who play banjo, like at a baker and live a cotton, but um, as far as I know, fiddle-wise, they're it. Um, so... Another cool thing to look into, there's a book about them called Way Up North in Dixie that is sort of about whether they wrote Dixie, but also is just like, we have a ton of letters from this family of black string band musicians who were freedmen in Ohio in the early 1800s and life was real weird. Um, it's a great window into a different time. Is that the family that the genuine Negro Jig is from? Purportedly, Purportedly. yes. And that they had that in some sheet music? Exactly. Well, I think that's um, another Emmett thing. And I could be wrong, but I've been trying to figure out whether we have like concrete information about genuine Negro Jig or Snowden's Jig Snowden. or whatever, um, and whether or not that is definitively from them, and whether Daniel Decatur Emmett wrote down the sheet music or whether they did. Um, I have not yet discovered the truth. Um, but I hope to talk to the people who wrote that book someday and, and get more information about that. I'd love to like see the letters. I think maybe Ben's fiddle is still around. What is it called again? Uh, the book, yeah. Way Up North in Dixie. Aside from like word of mouth, um, where do you find a lot of this history? Um, I have read a lot of books um, and I have on my website, there's a page that you can click just on the top right that says Black String Band Resources that you can click and it has like a list of every book that I've read and some books that I've only read part of and some books that I haven't read but come highly recommended. Um, yeah. And there's another one that's about to come out that I think is going to like blow everybody's mind. Uh, it's called Well of Souls and it's written by my friend Christina Gaddy who was one of the contributors to Banjo Roots and Branches that came out uh, pretty recently. And she's like, she is doing all of like the cutting edge banjo research and theorizing these days. She's a powerhouse. I'm going to be moderating the book launch in October in Baltimore, but um, I just got my advanced copy and it's very cool. So encourage y'all to look that up when it comes out or maybe pre-order pre-ordering is a very big deal for authors what's that book called again uh well of souls it has a foreword by Rhiannon giddens so yeah hi are we done is it time for lunch it's and jamming time. yeah yeah